Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming <clears throat> to the session. Uh, my name is uh, Karo Kachenga. I'm uh, the executive director of the Community Initiative for TB, HIV, and Malaria based in Zambia. I also sit on the union of the board representing uh, affected communities. I'll be co-chairing co this session on advocacy and community engagement with my colleague. Uh, maybe I'd let her introduce herself. Good morning once again. I am Grace Bongololombera. I work with Research for Equity and Community Health uh, Trust in Malawi. I'm glad to be co-chairing this session and looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Grace. So as you are aware, in this session, we are going to have presentations uh, from uh, around the world which are going to look at uh, finding the missing cases. Uh, some of it are going to look at effective use of corporate and social responsibility, which in many cases, in as much as we know it is a helpful strategy we don't usually use, so that, that would be helpful for us. We also look at community perceptions of uh, tuberculosis uh, in one of the areas in Ethiopia, as well as uh, looking at, again, I said, the hard to reach. But for me, another area that is exciting is looking at the engagement of public figures and uh, forming of uh, uh, coalitions. Uh, working with MPs, I just found out recently that it's a low-hanging fruit, something that in most of our countries we can use to support us, but we haven't. Um, and it would be good to hear uh, case studies that will help us go forward. So at the moment, we have five presenters. And we'll give each of them 15 minutes or so to present. And then after the first two presentations, we'll then uh, ask for, uh, we'll have a discussion, uh, ask people, ask questions. Not, not after each presentation, but after every two presentations, we'll give everybody an opportunity to ask questions. Our first presenter is going to be, um, is it Dr. Bo Mobengi? from Kenya, he worked, oh, he, sorry, he's a project manager with AMREF Health Africa, who's going to talk to us about finding the missing 20%, an active TB case finding through engagement of private healthcare providers in Mombasa County, Kenya. You can go ahead, please. Good morning. Um, my name is Duke Mobegi. I work with AMREF Health Africa in Kenya. And I'm going to present to you finding the missing 20% uh, tuberculosis active case finding through engagement of private providers in Mombasa County. And this was a project that was being implemented by about three partners. And I'm going to present what you actually did in Mombasa County. Just to really put this to show where the intervention was done, uh, there is the map of Kenya. And uh, Mombasa County is just somewhere down here. It's part of the coastal regions. And that is where the intervention uh, took place. And just for the sake of the people coming from all the world, Obama comes from somewhere near here. And also, that is where I come from. Okay. Just a little background. Um, in the year 2014, according to the World Health Organization, 9 million people developed TB worldwide. And our country, Kenya, is ranked number 15th among the 22 high burden TB countries that together contribute about 80% of the global TB burden. Kenya alone, in the year 2014, we notified about 89,000 TB patients, and out of which about 20.1% were from the private sector. And this is quite low about the target the country had of 25% coming from the private sector. And WHO actually estimates that this is about 79% of the expected case notification, so meaning we're missing about 21% of the TB patients who are out there. Now, some of the um, missing cases that are not captured in the TB program has been believed to present in private providers. In one way or the other, some of these private providers are not able to diagnose tuberculosis, and that is why we wanted to see if we can be able to engage the private providers, we can be able to get some of these uh, cases. Now, if you look at Mombasa County in terms of the data that we have, 
they notified about 4,726 uh, TB cases, and these gave a case notification rate of about 469 per 100,000 population. And this is quite high as compared to the national average, which is actually 208 per 100,000 uh, population. And this is according to the data of 2013. And so to intensify finding some of these missing cases, a global fund approved a request by the government of Kenya to really pilot an active case finding project in Mombasa because we believed that uh, we could be able to get some of these cases uh, in Mombasa County. And so this is the intervention that we did, and we looked at the data from April 2014 to December 2015. And so Amref Health Africa is the principal recipient for the Global Fund Kenya for the non-state actors. So we engaged one of our recipients, which is uh, CAP TLD, and this was really to coordinate, because Capital they have experience working the private providers, to really do the mapping of the private providers and coordinate the activities through their engagement in TB control. And so they help, uh, the private providers were mapped, and they kind of created linkage facilities whereby referral of these patients could be done for, for diagnosis. And so the private providers uh, were sensitized on a TB symptomatic screening, and then they were told if you screened a patient and was symptomatic, the link facility where they could be able to refer the patients to for screening and diagnosis. And during the process, uh, Amref Health Africa, working together the National TB Program, we visited and gave technical support and continuous medical education uh, on need basis in terms of the facilities that uh, had been engaged by CAPTLD. Now, all the presumptive TB patients who managed to present to the private health providers were referred to the link facilities for diagnosis. Their community health care volunteers, whom actually had been trained to ensure that follow-up of these patients really from the uh, point of referral to the referral link facility had, was complete, who were able to follow these patients to see if they actually managed to get um, to the facility for diagnosis and this happened through either fiscal or through phone calls, whereby patients could be able to be called and asked, you were referred to this facility, did you manage to get to that facility, and what were the results? Now, the national, all these things were doing using the National Community B reporting tools, and these were tools about contact tracing, uh, screening, and referral forms, purely by the government and approved by the National TB uh, program. And we used all these tools in documentation and reporting because we wanted to do everything that we currently were doing at that time to be reported and captured in the National TB uh, program. And all those who had been confirmed to be TB patients were notified and they were started on treatments in the treatment sites not from the places they were referred from, because some of them were chemists, but they were actually notified and treated in the treatment sites in Mombasa. To motivate the community health volunteers, we provided bicycles, and we gave them a monthly stipend of about 7,500. This is about $75 per month to do, to do this, this work. Uh, these are quick of the results in terms of the private providers. This I provide providers who are actually not offering regular TB services, but they're offering other services. About 3.2% were hospitals, about 1.3% were nursing homes. If you can see, the majority of those were private clinics that were not offering TB uh, treatment. And then there were medical or healthcare centers, which formed about 3.3%. Then 0.6% uh, were dispensaries. In our country, majority of the dispensaries are run by the government. So that is where the number is quite uh, low. This is, was our biggest target point, because this was about 54.7%, um, which are the chemists and the pharmacies. In most cases, you find that some patients actually walk and get drugs over the counter. And so you find that most of the people working in those chemists were not asking about TB issues. And that is why we thought, for example, if we targeted these and they were able to screen and refer them, we could be able to get some of these missing uh, cases. And then we had uh, a very small percentage of 1.3%. Uh, uh, these were herbalists or the traditional uh, healers. These are people who, in, in Kenya, they're not really recognized as part of the mainstream uh, healthcare system. They're considered as the alternative uh, kind of providers. What were the results in terms of uh, what we did? If you look at this uh, case, the number of facilities that were actually mapped as private was 539. But we were not able to engage all of them. We were only able to engage about 52% 
of them, and so we engaged 281 uh, facilities. And these 281 facilities were able to refer 908 presumptive TB patients. And out of the 908 presumptive TB patients who were referred, 487 actually arrived at the, for diagnosis. So meaning we had a lot of dropout that some of the patients were not able to complete the referral uh, pathway. And those who actually arrived, of the 487 who arrived, 25% of them, there's 125, actually were confirmed to have been having tuberculosis. So the question then we ask here is, what could have happened if all the 908 had arrived in the diagnostic facility? And if we went with about 25% of them then being positive, then our number here definitely could have been much higher. And this, remember, this number here is a number that if had we not put this intervention, there's no way they could have been able to be uh, captured in the treatment or on the notification kind of cases in the, TB, in the TB program. And so those are some of the things that we're trying to, we're trying to find out. And one of the key things that we've concluded is that civil society organizations can play a major role in engagement of private providers, which is crucial in TB active case finding in order to narrow the gap of the missed cases and need to be expanded. We only had 500 and something mapped, but engaged 52% of them. So if you actually had money to engage all of them, or most of them, then chances of getting the 20% that missed will be quite more higher. And because also the referral rate is also about 50%, we need to have more efforts that we need to increase the proportion of clients reaching the referral destination. If we have more presumptive TB patients get into the referral destination, then it could be able to help us capture more TB patients, and this will also be able to narrow that gap in terms of TB diagnosis. And so at this point, I want to acknowledge uh, the Ministry of Health from Kenya, uh, AMREF Health Africa, which was the principal recipient for this particular project for Global Fund. Uh, CHAC is Christian Health Association of Kenya, which also part of... Uh, uh, part of the project, looking at the faith-based uh, facilities and the Kenya Association for Prevention of Tuberculosis and Lung Disease in the country, CAP TLD, which were the people who are actually doing the work and coordinating the civil society, who are the civil society organization in Mombasa, coordinating the private providers to do this particular uh, project. Uh, then I also want to acknowledge the team, the Global Fund team, uh, led by their project manager, who's here, uh, who were able to give technical assistance to the, to the project. And thank you so much. That was my presentation. Thank you very much for the presentation. And like as I indicated when we started, we'll have two presentations, then we'll ask questions later. So please hold your questions for the first presentation. Then after the second one, we can have a discussion. Our next presentation is coming from Dr. Shah. Dr. Shah is uh, the Deputy Executive Director, so the Deputy Executive Health Officer of the Program Manager for the TV in the city? Yes. Yeah. So Dr. Shah is going to talk to us about the effective use of corporate social responsibility strategies to accelerate TB control in Mumbai, India. Let's go ahead. So thank you, Chair, for the introduction, uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like uh, all of us to revisit yesterday's uh, powerful keynote address by Stephen Lewis, where he gave us uh, 10 commandments, I would call it as commandments, as he has said, that 10 strategies. Uh, one of the important one was mobilizing the finance. So he mentioned that the U.S. agencies and the governments need to mobilize and prioritize the funding and need to increase the funding and breach the gap. While he and the governments are prioritizing that and you know, filling the bridge and the gap, we, all of us, at our end, has to do a bit to mobilize the funds and to also mobilize the resources, which is all required for our programs and our strategies to meet the goals of NTV. Today morning, we heard about uh, funding innovations uh, from Janet. And she mentioned about the funding innovations so I'm really happy that I'm talking to you today about one of such model which we implemented in Mumbai. And 
as far as uh, we are concerned, for two years it's running successfully and we look forward to go it ahead. So I begin with my uh, first slide. Sorry. So corporate social responsibility, this is the outline. I will just take you through some of the statistics of Mumbai and India. The corporate social responsibility as an opportunity, the mission, how we have engaged the model, and then the CSR partnerships, some of the achievements and the programs we have done, and then the CSR engagement, what is the way forward. The world, the Global Tuberculosis Report 2016 clearly indicates that India contributes to around 27% of the world TB cases, which is huge. And India is amongst the six countries which contributes to 60% of the world new TB cases. So definitely uh, we are into focus and India stands as a very strategic point where NTB goals has to be met. Uh, we, I'll bring you to Mumbai. Mumbai is a financial capital and hub for India. And as far as TB is concerned, the burden of TB in Mumbai is also enormous. Mumbai's population is almost 1% of the country, but the total TB cases which has been reported from Mumbai is almost 2% of the country. And if it comes to MDR-TB, it is around 11.5%. In terms of absolute figures, we register around 27 to 30,000 cases of drug-sensitive TB in the city, in the public sector, and almost 13 to 15,000 cases in the private sector. With the private sector engagement model, which we also have in Mumbai, we have this increased notification from private sector. So our roughly around 40,000 cases of drug-sensitive TB is registered annually in Mumbai, as well as drug-resistant drug TB, we have around 3,500 to 4,000 cases, which is newly registered every year. So with this enormous uh, uh, amount of uh, burden, what are the reasons, of course, the challenges as of any, in any metro cities, we have high burden, high populations, more than 12 million population, and we have 22,000 population per square kilometer, which is a high population density. We have these urban slums, more than 50% people staying in slum and slum-like areas. Not only that, we have migration as a bigger issue, where 37% of the people who are living in Mumbai are migrants, and also poor nutritional standards and poor health-seeking behavior and perception for TB. So all these adds and fuels up the TB epidemic and the transmission. So this brings us that what are the things needed to control such a big, huge epidemic? Definitely the funding and resources is required for implementing our programs. The program priorities are, of course, a private sector engagement, health system strengthening, and also strengthening the program infrastructure as well as the building the capacity of the program staff for doing a lot of new strategies which we are going to do specially to control the MDR-TB. So what is the funding? Uh, if I have to talk about the funding uh, in the in India, we we receive uh, we have a centrally funded program for RNTCP that is Revised National Tuberculosis Control Program. The funding comes from the central government to the state government to the municipal corporation, and each that is state and the corporation, the local bodies, they contribute some percentage into this funding. Obviously, the funding is not adequate. If I have to tell about the country, India needs around $300 million and more per year for control of TB, but last year's only allotment was $100 million. This came from World Bank, from global funds, etc. So there is a clear gap of uh, finances, uh, which is very obvious uh, in the reports which has been published. And we actually in Mumbai require more the four times money which we get at, at the present. Uh, if in terms of absolute money I have to talk, it's around 15 crore uh, rupees which we receive and, and we need more exactly the four times more the money. So definitely uh, where does the money come from? So we need to look for the innovations and we did some same. In 2013 we had a lot of MDR and XDR cases which was reported and then we started talking to the partners and NGOs and also started evolving certain new strategies and that is how this CSR strategy, that is corporate social responsibility, came up. And, and this, as a municipal corporation, we actually successfully used the strategies and we raised certain uh, services and funds through this implementing the strategies. So what is CSR? It is a continuing commitment by the business to contribute to the economic development while improving the quality of life of the workers and the families and also the community as a whole. There is a Companies Act 
which is in existence since 2013 in the country. And this act mandates all the companies who earns a profit of more than 500 crores per year to put their two years, uh, three years profit, 2% of the profit into a social cause. Now, this social cause could be an education, development, or it could be health. So companies have options. They can put money into there. And this is an important resource. As per one of the studies uh, by the Indian Statistics Institute, uh, approximately at that time, 2013, $4 billion was available across 8,000 companies, which were liable under the clause and the act. So, so, of course, it's a huge one, and Mumbai being the financial capital, we had a lot of corporate houses which is situated into Mumbai, and we, we really tapped them. The communicable disease is one of the areas which has been specified into this act, and, and, and it is a priority area, and we have been talking with the companies uh, to focus on this particular strategic aspect of the CSR. So what is the vision? Uh, Mumbai has a Mumbai mission for TB control. We have a strategic planning and we have strategies, seven strategies to control TB in Mumbai. And our vision is to have a long-term sustainable donor support to institute is institutionalize our mission. The objective is to develop the key partnerships between the donors and the corporate bodies and the municipal corporations and to work for the TB control in Mumbai. So we have developed this process. So process is like identifying the needs of the donor, the identifying the needs of the program, and thus the need assessment and database is developed. That's the first step. The second step is developing proposals, presenting to the companies, having meetings with them, and convincing them about our needs, and also developing the patient programs and developing uh, proposals which can be sent and then follow up on those meetings. And the third process is implementing. That is, once the things are finalized, once the proposal are accepted by the companies, uh, we search and we, we fix up the implementing partner, that is the NGO who is implementing uh, in the field. Of course, that again requires a certain uh, you know, criteria by the companies to put in the money, to uh, giving the money to the NGOs. So that also requires certain certifications by Indian laws. So, so secure the implementing agency is another task which uh, we need to achieve. And after that, develop the implementing protocols and develop monitoring standards, basically financial standards as well as the program indicators. So this is how uh, the, the program model is. And since last two years, we have uh, developed this model. And we have uh, consultants from Global Health Strategies also well working with us and helping us to develop and to support this particular model. So this is the Mumbai mission for TB control. We have seven strategic areas. One is a mission mode slum TB. Somebody was talking, I mean, just the speaker uh, talked about the active case finding. We have in the slum active case finding, and we have some NGOs and the companies who are supporting active case finding. The field activities is supported by this, and we have just started in the month of April 2016, and we have completed four months of active case finding in the slums, and especially we have prioritized the high-risk districts in Mumbai. Then access in terms of rapid diagnosis, uh, we have had companies who are supporting us and they have promised us to support the lab, development of the lab, and even the pre-treatment evaluations in terms of MDR-TB patients as well as some of the culture DST tests. In terms of uh, effective treatment, uh, nutrition is an important component which we look forward and we actually ask companies to provide nutrition to the patients and they are happily uh, engaging in that because that's also their uh, priority area where they would be very happy to support the patients uh, supporting the nutrition. And of course, extending the services to the patients who is visiting the private sector. So we have this private sector engagement model even in Mumbai. And through that also, we are engaging private sectors and providers. And the patients are also supported in terms of nutrition, free x-rays, and free genex. So these are the, some of the strategies which we are using and some of the funding which comes up from the CSR money. We are uh, you know, channelizing them to, to do those activities and the programs. The infection control, some of the N95 mask and some of uh, the infection control kits have been sponsored by the companies. And the awareness, the major, major role of the CSR funding is we are utilizing it for the awareness campaign. So I'll just show you in a while uh, what are the achievements which uh, we have done. The value of resources which has been mobilized in last two years is around 8.5 crore rupees. That is $1.2 million in terms of both cash and kind. The intervention areas are focused as three, awareness, nutrition support, and infection control measures. These are some of the companies who are supported. Most of the banks, they want to put their profit into the CSR, and we have tapped those resources. 
you saw this gentleman yesterday, Mr. Amitabh Bachchan, who is our brand ambassador for uh, DB Harega Desh Jitega campaign. And, and, and we have actually started in Municipal Corporation this particular campaign and went national. And I'm very glad that uh, now it has become kind of a brand in Mumbai and in the, in the country. And this particular uh, uh, campaign has gone to the communities. And we have had a kind of a quality research also on this campaign. What is the uptake of this campaign? And what is the result? And what is the impact of this campaign? So in terms of uh, CSR involvement, we are using the funds from CSR for taking this campaign to the community and different medias, like we have used buses and trains and we have done a branding of trains and all the resources and the money which is required is coming from CSR. We have radio spots, we have TV spots, we have also the channels which is uh, showing the, the documentaries and the small films which has been produced under this campaign. And we have cinemas which we have been uh, showing it and also the outdoor, the posters and the hoardings. All these is uh, done uh, through this. I'll just quickly run the impact of the campaign. Uh, the, there was a significant increase in top of the mind recall after this campaign and it, from 8 to 21 percent, which is a very significant rise. You can see here some of the more pictures which has been supported through the program. We allow the companies to put their logos and uh, you know acknowledge them when they are supporting this campaign. This is some of the train and the bus campaigns, and this is the nutrition uh, uh, kits which has been distributed to the patients. The N95 mask also been supported uh, through some of the companies. So uh, these are some of the, the activities we did. So I would just come to some last two slides. This, there are a lot of challenges in having this model. It's not that it's very easy to implement this kind of funding model. So companies are still formulating their CSR strategy. The preference of area, a lot of companies, they prefer only the areas where they are situated. So if I want to do in some particular district, the company does not have uh, their operations in that district, they might refuse. So we really started, we have to look for companies who work in those particular districts. The lack of synergy uh, in priorities, sometimes they do not prioritize TB as a whole. They want to work in a disease prevention, but not particularly TB. So that that that, that there we have to negotiate. And no centralized platform which is available for all the companies yet in the country and lack of suitable ground implementing partners sometimes also lead to some of the challenges. The program challenges is accepting the finances from the companies. So financial mechanisms has to be developed. We have tried to sort out, sort out these issues and we are trying to even ask and and, and also enroll our administrators so that direct finances can be accepted through the societies and the funding can be a smooth uh, funding. The commitments are short. These programs, what I showed you, are a very specific period for a six month or a year. It may not be sustainable for four to six years. So we are looking at a sustainable model and we are now engaging, we are having a dialogue with the companies this coming month where we can engage it for a very longer time. And Sustainability of the, again I said, is uh, again an issue. So what is the way forward we are looking at is ensuring that sustainability of the CSR engagement model has to be there. This kind of model can be tapped by the states or some other countries where these act, this kind of provisions are available. Relationship building with the donors, scaling off of the effective interventions in all the parts of the city and customized strategy to engage the individual donors and periodic review of the strategy is really important. So I would end with this last slide, Mr. Ratan Tata, he's a visionary and he's the chairman of the Tata Group, uh, which is a leading corporate house in India, says that business need to go beyond the interest of the companies to the communities they serve. So thank you very much and would like to take some questions. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shah. And I think before I open the floor for questions, uh, I still want to call out to the speakers. If there are speakers who came in after we started, please come this way and see my colleague and register yourselves. Um, and <clears throat> so we've heard how uh, public-private partnership is important. We've heard the case study uh, of India, how the two, uh, all the, uh, the, the, the companies are requested to give a 2% of their profits. And from Kenya, we've also heard how important it is. I was looking at the figures to say if there hadn't been this collaboration between the two groups, which means Kenya would have lost the, uh, the 124 people that were found to have had TB. So again, at the root of all this, we still have the community uh, volunteers who are the foot soldiers. So I would now like to open it up for questions. Yes, please. I'll take the two this way first. Thank you very much. Um, 
I think, the sorry, I think there's a mic coming at the back. Yeah. Thank you to the two presenters. I was comparing the Mumbai story to Mombasa story. And uh, I tend to think that that of Mumbai has more sustainability. I want to know from my friend in Mombasa, how are you going to roll up this? Because for it to be sustainable, you probably need to come up with more strategies since this is just a pilot. So any ideas to roll this up? Because it's a very good project. Mm. Okay. We'll, take the, we'll take four questions in this round. Uh, good morning, all. My name is uh, Dr. Tony Mecca. I work for German Leprosy and TB Relief Association in Nigeria. Uh, my question is for my friend from Kenya. Um, given the fact that uh, the, the private practitioners you, you talk about are people who earn their living by keeping their clientele, uh, it obviously means that uh, probably there could be some level of conflict of interest when you want them to, to help you to uh, screen patients and refer. So I, I want to know whether how you handled that aspect, given the fact that uh, uh, the presumptive DB cases form part of their clientele through which they end their living. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think we can pass it down to Second. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, question for Dr. Shah. Um, the 2% of the CSR is mandated by law, but I assume there is some capacity for companies to choose where the funding goes. So I'm curious as to whether you faced any resistance in getting companies over the line to contribute to TB programs, given that it's probably things with less stigma attached that are good to attach your brand to, perhaps more so than something like TB. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Well, we can take one more question in this round. We just pass it to thank you. Oh, okay. So let me pass you the mic. So thank you, Mr. Gentleman. Uh, he asked about the sustainability, how, how we are planning the sustainability. Uh, as I said that we are trying to institutionalize the whole mechanism. So once you institutionalize means you put it into your own institution as a part of your kind of a program. So it is it is incorporated into the Mumbai Mission for TB Control. So it's no way different from our routine program implementation. So the we, we have like funding, uh, uh, we are very having a, a very specific funding which is uh, coming from the state, from the national level, from the municipal corporation. And then we identify the gaps. It's not that we are dependent on the funds, but we identify the gaps and we only use these funds where we feel that the corporation or the central government or the state government is not able to fill in or we are falling short. So, so it's kind of a sustainable in a way that we would identify the areas which is not been funded by the governments and hence and, and also the donor is comfortable funding that. So I think it's quite sustainable. It's only the manpower who will do the follow up. Do we have some support in the office? Yes, we do have and we are trying to develop a human resource to keep on following up with the companies and getting these funds into the program. The second question about yours is about the stigma, whether the companies want to put it into the TB control. So far, the companies which we have spoken, so far the banks we have spoken, they were happy. And they, they, I mean, we do not associate them with a TB or something. They feel that it's an awareness campaign. And once they understand the gratitude, they understand the seriousness of the, uh, the work, I don't think so uh, they, they really want to separate it out from them. In fact, the nutrition, I, I showed you the nutrition, the awareness are the two major key areas where they are interested. They may not be interested in the infrastructure spending, but they are interested in awareness. And what they are interested is they should be shown. I mean, they should be given a due acknowledgement. Their presence should be felt into the you know, community. So that is what they are interested. And if you, if you take care of that interest, then, then they are ready to uh, fund it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as that said, I have a team from Kenya, so if there's anything any of the team members want to add, they can be able to add this. Our first question about sustainability. One of the key things in Kenya, there's a government policy about community health strategy. 
that actually stipulates on how much uh, the community health volunteers need to be paid. And for us, what we actually did was to prove to them that this model is able to work. And so they, uh, in, health, in Kenya, health has been devolved to the 47 counties, administrative units that the constitution created in 2010. And so in each of these particular counties, they're able to create their own uh, policies about human uh, health workforce in terms of they're going to manage that. And so the community health volunteers are actually being absorbed by the county governments in the health mainstream to continue doing their follow-up. In terms of tests, we're not paying anything. TB treatment in our country and test is free. And so what they could only be able to do that was just really to follow them up and they're able to get that. The other thing that the TB program is doing is to create some more centers about diagnostic areas and even to have some of the private facilities and willing to, willing to do the TB uh, diagnostics. Uh, my friend from Nigeria about the conflict of interest, actually it was all about sensitization. Uh, just a quick background in terms of how the private over-the-counter works. As a client, I just walk to the counter and I tell you I have this chest problem. So for you, what you do because you're running a chemist is you give me a drug and I just go home. And so what you're able to tell them is that you can still continue pumping drugs and antibiotics to this patient, but there's no improvement. And so this patient at one point they'll say, I've come to a, to a chemist so many times, but I'm not having any improvement. But if a client comes and you're able to tell them, in as far as your signs and symptoms that you've actually given me, I suspect you could be having TB. And so I'll advise you take a TB test. Somehow it brought confidence of uh, the patients to go to that particular a chemist or private provider. So it was actually kind of more improving the service delivery. For example, if a patient came and was referred for TB diagnosis and they were found to have TB, then they could believe more the person who actually referred them. So it was actually working to their advantages. Anything? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'll now pass on to my co-chair to present the other presenters. Thank you so much. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Ricardo Reyes. He is a provisional health officer in Philippines. Dr. Ricardo, please. Sorry. I forgot to say uh, Dr. Ricardo will be uh, talking to us on addressing TB vulnerability amongst the indigenous tribes in Bukingdon province in Philippines. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, with me is my co-author, Dr. Ted Yu from USAID Impact. We will take you on a short tour to my beloved province in Bukidnon, Philippines. And then you'll get a bird's eye view of the beauty of the province from a different perspective, that of health and disease, illness and healing. In particular, you will see the challenges of tuberculosis as a disease, and our TB prevention and care services. We will delve in areas where the services need improvement and how we are addressing those gaps. The whole point of this presentation would be to share the Bukidnon experience on how we were able to address TB vulnerability among our indigenous peoples. Bukidnon, which means mountainous, because it's full of mountains, the province is full of mountains, is a melting pot of many tribes, and is populated by around 1.4 million people, distributed among 20 municipalities and two component cities. The province is the country's major producer of pineapple, corn, sugar, banana, coffee, rubber, cassava, tomato, and other fruits and vegetables. It is also a major producer of poultry, hogs, and cattle. Flowers and floriculture abound, as its biodiversity and endemic species of flora and fauna is one of the richest in the country. The province is a melting pot of different indigenous tribes with almost 40% of our population represented by different indigenous people's communities. They are the Tala Andig, the Higaunon, Bukidnon, Umayamnon, Matigsalog, Manubo, and Tiguahanon. The names were derived from the rivers and watershed areas that they inhabited. 
The Matigsalogs, for example, are the people who live along the Salog River. And the Tiguahanons are the natives who inhabit the banks of the Tigua River. The presence of these IP communities has an important implication on the delivery of government economic and social services. These services must be culturally sensitive and appropriate, taking into consideration the IP community's worldviews and belief systems, in this case, their concepts of health and healing. There are a number of reasons which have hampered the TB prevention and care services, but these are what we consider critical for the moment. Certain marginalized population groups remain underserved. These groups are highly vulnerable to TB and makes case finding and case holding particularly hard to manage, leading to poor health outcomes and less than optimal program results at the local level. For a fact that they live in the least accessible areas with no means of transportation, communication, education, and health structures. Thus, basic services are not regularly provided. From the provincial success, uh, perspective, we see the following challenges in TB control, both from the supply side and the demand side. The following were the interventions, baby steps actually, that we did in response to the given gaps. To use an analogy, we use the rice cake approach to advocacy, advocating from above by attending to municipal IPMR's meeting and to lobby for support and also advocating from below in the villages where the IP members were through TB health education and intensified case finding. So flames from above and flames from below, much like cooking the Philippine rice cake. In one year of implementation, we are happy to share with you some modest gains as initial results of the social mobilization efforts. One, IPMRs are actively holding TB education sessions. Two, there's 10% additionality to the no total notified cases in six municipalities. And two among the treated patients had completed treatment and were cured and the rest are still undergoing treatment. Similar case finding activities are being conducted in other municipalities of the province. In the following year, there are 204 individuals with possible TB symptoms who consulted in the DOTS facilities. 100% of them underwent the required sputum examinations and 24% were diagnosed bacteriologically confirmed for TB. All have begun treatment with community volunteers as treatment partners. With these results, we can safely say that proper training on TB education and identifying and referring TB presumptive cases to the nearest health center Mandatory representatives of indigenous peoples tasked to participate in local legislation and decision making can effectively contribute to improving case finding in IP communities, thus addressing significantly their vulnerability to TB. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Richard, for that presentation, and you've just done it before time. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Song. Uh, he is from Cambodia. He will be presenting to us uh, on reaching the hard to reach, that's finding the missing cases. Your time, Dr. Song. Thank you so much, uh, Chair, for the session, and good morning, everyone. So today, today I will bring you uh, to a way of, you know, finding more cases. As we said, there is a lot of missing cases. Even we try the best. Uh, there is a, 
a tool, but there is still, you know, almost one third of the case around the globe have been missed. So Cambodia is not, you know, among those countries as well. So the, this presentation will bring you some kind of, you know, try to find missing case among elder people in Cambodia. Let me try. Which one? Okay. Cambodia has been classified as, you know, among the one among the highest country of TB burden in in the in the world as well. So uh, the prevalent rate is around, you know, uh, six hundred uh, case per hundred thousand population, and the incident is around almost four hundred per thousand population. The mortality rate is really high. I think it's considered as the second highest country in the world. But however, the MDR TB prevalence is pretty low. You know, it's, it's around 1.2 among, 1.4 among new cases and, you know, among relapsed cases around 11%. So it's pretty low comparing to other countries. So if we look back how much we missed the case. According to WHO to report 2015, we found that around case notification in the country is around 72%. And that's estimate it's around 16,000 that have been missed. And we have been questioned who's there are, which population group that that's we more likely are not reaching those people. And then if we consider how's, how's we going to find them as well. So in 2011, Cambodia had been gone through two phases of TB prevalence survey. One, I think, is in 2000, uh, 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 2002, and the other is 2011. And based on the report in 2011, we found that the bacteriological positive prevalent among those elderly people is around 3%, which is very high. And then the smear positive prevalent rate is around, you know, 1,000 is around 1%. Uh, that's, that's quite high. And we also looking, where are those people, those people as well, in terms of the the, we found through this prevalent, according to the poverty rate, so the, the district where the poverty rate is high, the case notification even among smear positive is very low. So this means that the, the, the TB cases are, are missing in those areas comparing to other. Similarly, if we look at the TB prevalent as well, you know, the, the rural area are more likely to have more case comparing to, to, to the urban area. These, I think, similar to other countries as well. So in, in terms of, you know, patient pathway, we know that normally when people are sick, if there is some availability of help people at the community, they will go through that. But if not, and then they will come to a health center and we is the frontline services uh, the most, and they will get care of those. But most likely, those diagnosis tools are not available at health center level, especially, you know, expert and chair x-ray, which very difficult to assess by those elderly people, which were most likely very poor and doesn't have all means of transportation. And as you can see, some point the distance from their home to those are very high, are very far, and also the time uh, right now because of you know a lot of migration, young people are going to urban area to earn and then leave their kid at home. So most likely their kid is living with with the grandchildren and uh, grand grandmother or grandparent, and they are not able to come because they cannot leave their grandchildren at home alone. So this is also some kind of challenging for them to assess care. Secondly, it's also their behavior, some kind of, you know, if they're most likely not educated, they're also very afraid and 
uh, to go to a health, you know, healthcare provider. And at some point, they're also related to stigma regarding those TB patients as well. So I think most likely, you know, TB case where we're going to find them, most likely in every place where we go. So one is in community level, second is health center, where they're going to seek care, not only TB, but other disease. And then the second is hospital, which is a health facility. And the, the, the previous presenter already talked about, you know, private clinic and, and pharmacy. So that's also capture on those parts as well. So what the project have proposed is we call a semi-active case finding, which normally in our country, active case finding meaning that there is a, you know, a diagnosis is going to bring at the field level, at the point of care, including expert and chair x-ray. So semi Active case finding is just a modifier of those active case finding. And what uh, the approach that we do is if we involve the religious, religious sector to really involve and, and you know, mobilize those uh, effort in terms of TB screening activity at those sitting. And what we know as well, those elder people normally come to a religious setting in, in Cambodia we call pagoda, where people most likely to go and pray. And then also a mosque where Muslim people are went there as well. So, and that's, we, we think that this is probably a most appropriate place that we can screen those people without mobilizing from the community because they come by their own as well. And we mobilize, we try to institutionalize uh, uh, those um, people working with the government in health center and also a village health support group which is, uh, you know, people working in community and as part of the health center uh, uh, support as well. And then the release just leader involved in that. The, the sputum collection and transportation will be, you know, sputum will be collect in that side and transportation will, will do in a batch to uh, refer a hospital for expert testing. Uh, then the, a feedback mechanism on the result will come back to a health center which is close by there. So I just bring you a little bit to uh, really how we are going to do that. If you look at here, most likely, sorry, I think, which one? Oh, sorry. So this one represents the community. So people are, let, let's say this is a place where people are going to worship. So, and then we have, at the beginning, normally um, there is a preparation phase. So normally a health, village we, we health support group normally come and tell religious leader and they, they will tell, you know, during this day, they will come and then they will provide some education and TB screening as well. So what they do during the screening activities, the village health support group will provide some kind of some education, TB education to those elderly people and then including those, you know, if you have this kind of symptom for classic TB symptom and then we will screen them. And then they also pr provide an education about how to collect a good sputum as well. So these are patient pathway, and I think after they have been identified uh, presumptive TB, and then sputum will be collected, and then will be bring in a batch, not individual, to a referral hospital normally for gene expert and testing, and the result of that result of expert will come back uh, to health center, and then they provide um, provide education and treatment, initiate treatment to that. So these the you know, diagnosis algorithm, algorithm flow, and I think if people have one, not four, because Cambodia go beyond that, one among, you know, the four symptoms, and then they will ask for sputum, and then, and then if sputum, uh, if reef, and, and for expert, and if expert positive for TB, they pre pre prefer to and the RTB side, but if not, and then we'll modify, uh, notify and initiate on treatment. And this, if the result of expert is negative, then check X-ray abnormality, and then also treatment as well. 
So this is the, most likely the flow uh, that we use so far for that activity. And, and the chair is ray normally at the referral hospital level. Uh, so is it work? You know, what we have been done so far and described, is it work? So if we look at that, we have been doing in uh, screening in around 200 uh, pagoda already almost. And 7,000 elderly people have been screened for TB symptom. And then 60% of those, around 4,000, 4, uh, 4, have been uh, having, you know, uh, identified a presumptive TB. And then 85 uh, TB cases, which I think is around 1.5 you know, percents, uh, which is very high comparing to, to uh, the, the national prevalent uh, survey, which is around six, six, 606 uh, TA, uh, per 100,000 population, so it be very high. So I think we have the opportunity as well, during that project, we have the opportunity to review what's is it working very well? We have a, a consultant and com expert in looking at that. What, you know, if we look at this graph, it's only one. I present you, it is only one operational district. So, sorry. So these, if you look at the case notification among elder people, uh, normally the average, if you look, the incident is around 100 because this is a quarterly, so we divide by three. So if you look at that, it's above. So that's increased case notification for, for sure. And if you look at you know, case notification of all TB patients in that operational district, we even see below you know, the average, if you look at the curve, is going down. But when we implement that activity, this, the curve is going up. So that means that the the, the project that we initiate is working. So even we have some kind of you know, success, but there is also a lot of challenging, especially when we, in terms of you know, sputum quality, and most likely elder people are very difficult to collect sputum, uh, and, and then normally sputum are not collect yeah, at, during the day time, so it's very difficult. And then there's also if, you know, in Cambodia, there is a lot of uh, people are moving to uh, identify a smear negative. So access to chair X-ray is a major concern for us in terms of transport and, and then poor quality or unavailability of, 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 of chair X-ray machine and then the capacity of the reader as well. So just take one, two more slides, sorry. Uh, I think there is a, a challenge, I, I think, similar to other countries as well. So this, based on the TB prevalence survey, is around 70% of the case, TB case are found asymptomatic. So the approach that we are working so far is only address the symptom one and not really address as a symptom. And you can see around 70% as, as that. So the take home message for here is the, the semi-active case finding is, is, is Consider as one uh, uh, successful approach which increase the case notification, and then if you look at that, uh, the, that slide is increased over time, and then comparing to general population. So hope, and I think that this approach is more more sustainable because all these have been incorporated with the you know existing TB program and not standalone one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, maybe for those that have questions, please just quickly uh, note down the questions. We've not done well on time, so what we'll do is just express-wise, we'll have all the presentations, then at the end, we'll have like time for discussions so that people don't miss their next um, uh, uh, meetings. The next, Presenter is Batnaga. Have I pronounced it well? Okay. <laughs> uh, she will be presenting to us from uh, India. She is effects care of marketing and communication, and she'll be uh, presenting on the importance of uh, record keeping, documentation, and data management. 
Your time, please. Um, I think this is not the one. No, she's starting with this one. This one is mine. Ah, you're starting with the other one. Fine. It's all right. I think you're presenting too, you're right? Presenting yes, I'm presenting for my okay. colleague. who we, have, we share the same surname, so... All right. Okay, ah. so you, you so I'll go with mine this first. One. This is the one. Engagement yes. to public Yes, then the figures. next person will come, then you'll come back. Yeah, I'll come back for that okay, one. Okay, fine. It's all right. Hi, good afternoon. This is not... I do it for her first? No, you can do the engagement. So that's not coming in screen? The first one, the one that was the first. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Anumega and I'll talk on behalf of Challenge CB project from India, which is being implemented by the Union Southeast Asia office. And um, the theme for my presentation is engagement of public figures as catalysts of change. Um, you're all aware about the, the, the TB burden that India shares. It is the highest burden with more than a quarter of cases coming from India. Making TB a national priority has been government's uh, top agenda, and government has launched Call to Action for a TB-Free India, where the partnership seeks to engage other partners to strengthen efforts to reduce TB incidents and improve detection and treatment. Uh, the study design that I've used is analysis of uh, reports from January to August till now, uh, all related to Call to Action for TB-Free India keywords, Reports that mention usage of public figures who've come forward for the support. The trends have been analyzed, publication kind of report, where have they been placed, which regions have they appeared in, uh, and an analysis of why weight analysis was carried out to understand the correlation. Um, so there are types of reports, and the kind of media they've been placed in, from which region they are coming, who's written about it, what kind of issues have been highlighted, and the quotes from public figures. Um, post the analysis, we realized the results that have come forward. Uh, we had Mr. Amitabh Bachchan, um, the U.S. Ambassador, Mr. Richard Verma, uh, Sri Ratan Tata, I, um, a corporate conglomerate from India. They all have come forward. And we realized about 40% of reports that came in on TV in the Indian media last year talked about Mr. Bachchan. So had he not been involved, probably we would not have seen so many of articles coming forward. So many giving all the more reasons for readers to go through what's happening in the world of TB. Um, additional reports 68 in number had come forward with Mr. Uh, Richard Verma, the U US ambassador to India, along with Mr. Uh, Ratan Tata, the chairman. They came forward to support an event in India uh, on TB Free India. The chairman and managing director, Dr. Uh, Naresh Trehan of Medanta, he had also attended one of the corporate meets and has launched his own mission, TB Free Haryana, a state in India along with the chief minister of the state, uh, actor Amitabh Bachchan and US ambassador to come forward and support the initiative. So there was a lot of media coverage around the events or issues which had the celebrities engaged and involved. The Indian parliamentarians have come forward for this support and there has been an increase in the number of reports that have come out. Mr. Bachchan talked, retweeted, shared his views on TB Free India and Call to Action on his own uh, Facebook and Twitter pages, which has further, I mean, we've give, got an impetus on social media through him as well. His, his coming forward as a cured TB patient gave motivation to about 30 cured, uh, 30 cured patients from India who came forward, shared their stories in media and in open public with us, and addressing stigma, which is still a big and a major cause why patients usually do not come forward with their stories. So media advocacy on the social front has also added a lot of, uh, I mean, it's given a lot of uh, acceleration there. Content related to survivors and high, has given us high engagement, especially from doctors, advocates, and experts coming forward. Public figures who have been engaged till now with us have been Ratan Tata, Amitabh Bachchan, Richard Verma, uh, and MP Mr. PJ Kurian, Anurag Thakur, Radesh Trehan. So people who've who are at the helm of things and who are talking about what's happening in the country, who are opinion leaders. Uh, quotes from them on work losses, their efforts, their voice support has made a difference. The media has talked in large. Uh, the, the, the jump from the media reports on work losses has jumped from 165 to 361 this year, and largely because of 
few of the opinion leaders who've been talking a lot about tuberculosis. And some of them have come forward as Mr. Bachchan, I mean, you saw the video last evening, the way he has participated. He's coming forward for the national campaign. Uh, there are corporates who are coming forward with their resource commitment. And all of this has added and given us a lot of increase in the media visibility and reporting on issues that need more public health focus. This has given us much more and many more reasons to move beyond the usual statistic reporting numbers, the TB deaths, but many more reasons. Talking more about uh, the socioeconomic impact, what the TB patients go through, their, their ordeal uh, while they're on the treatment, and other issues have been broadened thanks to the engagement of the public figures. That is it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just when I was about to like flag the five minutes, you were done. Thank you so much. Yes, I As think, okay. yeah, the next person is my colleague, Michelle. Michelle uh, Emerson is from Result International, Australia, and she'll be presenting to us on behalf of uh, the Australian Tuberculosis Forum, talking about building coalitions for evidence-based parliamentary advocacy to end TB. Thanks, Carol, and good morning, everyone. Um, just to give you a brief overview of the presentation, I'm going to start with some Australian context and the history, successes and challenges faced by the Australasian TB Forum and plans for its future, and finally, some of the lessons that we've learned from its short history so far. But before I begin, I'd just like to start with a quick straw poll. So put your hand up if you're passionate about TB. Good, I, I hope that would be most people in the room. Keep your hand up, keep your hand up. If you know the name of the person who is your member of parliament, whatever title they might have in the country you come from, whoever it is that's elected to represent you. Okay, some hands have gone down there. <laughs> All right, finally, now, I want you to keep your hand up if you've ever gone and met with that person or written them a letter about TB. Hmm, significant number of hands have gone down. All right, everyone can put your hands down now, thanks. So the question is, how can we expect our political leaders to represent us and to be informed on issues they're voting on and making decisions about if we aren't talking to them? We, the people in this room, the people at this conference, need to lead our leaders. And the, Australian, the Australasian TB Forum exists to help bridge that gap to create strong inter interdisciplinary partnerships that affect political change. Thank you. So some quick background. Australia's enjoyed strong domestic TB control since the 1980s. But it's in a WHO region, the Western Pacific, that reports 1.6 million cases of TB annually. Australia makes various contributions to the fight against TB, funding for product development partnerships, a special financial commitment for TB prevention and treatment in Papua New Guinea, which is Australia's nearest neighbour and has an enduring problem with drug-resistant tuberculosis, investment in the Global Fund, technical assistance for TB, and involvement in regional bodies such as the Regional Green Light Committee. There is increasing bureaucratic and political receptiveness in this context to the argument for regional health security, that is, seeing the control of TB and other communicable diseases as key to both national and regional prosperity and security. But the Australian aid program has been significantly cut over the last several years. It was down 5% in the last financial year, and since 2014, it's shrunk by 20%, with health programs particularly affected. Finally, in comparison with malaria, where Australia has a long research history, and HIV, where the country's had a well-recognised and very strong national response, TB doesn't have a high academic or political profile in the country. The research sector's small. They have expertise in basic science and in Papua New Guinea, as well as in epidemiology, public health and some clinical research. Results International Australia is the TB parliamentary advocacy lead and is also home to the Secretariat for the Australian TB Caucus, 
which brings together federal parliamentarians who are interested in TB and in how Australia can best contribute to its global eradication. But until the advent of the Australasian Tuberculosis Forum, these efforts weren't integrated to affect political change. So the Australasian Tuberculosis Forum, or the ATF, was launched officially on World TB Day 2015. It's a network of policymakers, healthcare workers, researchers, advocates, and people affected by TB. The ATF aims to bridge the gaps of knowledge, implementation, and ambition for TB prevention, care, and elimination in the Asia Pacific region. In this picture, you can see the inaugural chair of the ATF, Professor Justin Denham, patient advocate Louisa Peter from the Philippines, and Australia's Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Honourable Julie Bishop, at the launch. The forum partners with organisations that share its aims, including the Burnett Institute, which is a medical research body, some of the TB-related PDPs, Results International Australia, MSF Australia, and Policy Cures, which is a group that specialises in research and strategy on R&D policy and funding for neglected diseases. The Forum Secretariat is dispersed across Australia with technical support from the Centre of Research Excellence in Tuberculosis Control at the University of Sydney. The ATF is an independent, not-for-profit organisation, a registered health promotion charity, and is also a member of the Stop TB Partnership. In the short history of the ATF, its collaborative approach has seen a number of successes, examples of which include launches of national and regional TB caucuses. And here you can see the launch event on World TB Day this year of the Australian TB caucus. The co-chair of the Australian and Asia Pacific caucuses, the Honourable Warren Ench MP, is speaking. And this event was quite well covered in the national media. There are also meetings last month in Canberra for the ATF with FIND and TB Alliance, which are both supported by Australian government funding. So now members of the forum, who are themselves often researchers, have the latest product development information, and they can use it to advocate themselves for continuation of this Australian financial support. And finally, there have been events for World TB Day, both this year and last year. In essence, the ATF is a relationship broker. It's allowed advocates to tap scientific knowledge for more nuanced and evidence-based policy proposals. It's helped researchers and medical professionals begin to form relationships with politicians and be seen themselves as TB experts. It's brought people affected by TB into public forums to advocate for political engagement. And finally, it's begun to sensitise the media to often complex TB-related issues. So the ATF has made pleasing progress in its short history towards building coalitions for evidence-based advocacy to end TB, but the work hasn't been without its challenges. These include competition for funding, both for individuals and groups within the ATF, particularly for the researchers, and externally. Within the Australian aid budget, having been cut, there's a lot of competition amongst a lot of very worthy issues and um, issues and challenges. Working out what the ATF and the Australian TB caucus can do for each other and how to make the most of the fact that both groups have quite limited time. There's the ongoing low profile for TB in Australia and some work ongoing to secure the ATF's own future, including finding funding to formalise its administration, creating membership engagement activities and more fully developing other parts of its work, such as education, while still continuing with its advocacy. So in a national context where TB has a low profile and a small share of funding, the list of potential future activities for the ATF is quite long. But some of these include, on the advocacy side, various elements such as looking further at the ATF's own advocacy strategy, seeking more meetings with federal politicians, and anticipating the next federal budget, where in particular the next round of PDP funding is going to be decided. And looking for more and better ways to tell stories about TB, through research translation, in the media, and more generally for the Australian public, engaging them in the narrative around TB and why it matters to them. So I think this is the key slide. Some of the lessons we've learned from this kind of activity. Firstly, and I think most importantly, storytelling 
and human connection are crucial. Yes, a lot of politics does end up coming down to money, but politicians are human beings and they like to hear stories about other human beings. So the ATF creates opportunities for researchers and politicians to engage and to talk about how Australia can continue to contribute in the TB space. What helps make these conversations possible is the time and the effort spent cultivating relationships. Securing access, gaining trust, finding out about the people that we're going to meet and how all of this can be mutually beneficial. Discovering what you have in common sounds really simple, but it's actually really powerful. Find out if a politician you're going to meet with has engaged on similar issues before, or if there's something you can thank them for. I think in every country, politicians are always being criticised, sometimes quite rightly so. As I said, they are human beings. They actually like to be thanked for things as well. And finally, MPs are incredibly busy. If we want them to engage, we need to do some of the work for them. Before we go and meet with anyone, we prepare a two-page brief that covers the problem, the background, and the action that we're seeking. That document forms a basis for our discussion, and then they have something they can take away and refer to later. Now, advocates and researchers also have limited time, so we need to choose carefully who we engage and always have a strategic reason for doing so. So we look to take into meetings people who can speak authoritatively, be they researcher, someone with knowledge of a particular place, or a patient advocate with first-hand experience of TB. And when you find someone in a position of influence who has a specific interest, which you find out by researching them, seeing what their interests are, give them information and assist them to use it however is most appropriate. So, for example, the other co-chair of the Australian TB Caucus, the Honourable Matt Thistlethwaite, MP, we've discovered is quite passionate about TB vaccines. He has four children, they're all fully vaccinated for everything else, and he was horrified to discover that if they needed it, they couldn't get a vaccine for TB. When we found that out, we were able to give him more information and help him to engage with the media. Finally, we do our best in allowing everyone to play to their strengths. Advocates assist researchers and politicians with media contacts and opportunities to act. But advocates and politicians owe it to researchers, healthcare workers and people affected by TB to keep our technical knowledge up to date and to learn more about the experience of those affected and those at the coalface. So in conclusion, worldwide, often advocates, researchers, medical professionals and people affected by TB are separated from each other and have little in-depth appreciation of the work that other groups do. The ATF's great strength is its diversity. It involves a wide range of stakeholders, allowing for more robust debate and collaboration that promotes political engagement around TB. In short, we go further when we go together. And we suggest that the model of something like a TB forum is an example that other advocates, researchers and medical professionals might consider using. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. We had four presentations back to back. Now it's time for questions. Maybe just a quick reminder, we had a presentation from Batnaga on using uh, public figures to garner support for TB, increasing visibility for TB, and another presentation from Cambodia, another uh, presentation on uh, building coalitions uh, to advocate for TB, as well as using community structures uh, for active t uh, case uh, finding. So your questions, please, and uh, the presenters will just not uh, th this question is coming to me and you respond uh, as necessary. Anyone ready? Any questions for the presenters? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Tosi Ade from Nigeria. I'm just interested in the Cambodia uh, active case finding. Very beautiful presentation. Uh, the religious leaders, are they the ones that carry out the screening, the presumptive screening? Or do you have um, people in the community that does the screening precisely so that they can know who is a presumptive case that they can now uh, refer to, to the, uh, for the chest x-ray? Is it the religious leaders themselves or who are the people in the uh, religious homes that carry out the screening? I, 
I'll go as well. Hi, uh, Rachel from Results UK, and my question's for Michelle. I thought that was a really interesting presentation. I really think that's something we can all try and do in and replicate in different regions and countries. My question is about the kind of real the activities that you do. Is there anything that the group comes together to kind of really um, like do you kind of commission reports or do you look into kind of do you do joint consultations for things within the Australian Parliament or or government is there any kind of things that you can examples of things that you do together that has more clout than individual partners yes she had her hand up yeah sorry is it possible to have the reply uh, the response now or no, we're taking three questions and then they respond. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I had a question for the colleague from India with a really interesting presentation. Um, I'm wondering how the public figures are recruited or drawn into the advocacy that they're doing. And the particular reason I'm asking is it struck me that all of the pictures were of men. So I, I know that one of the issues was women's health. So I'm just curious about that. So thank you. Yeah, we can start with the Cambodia uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I, I, just to clarify, I, I think the real leader is just who inform, not doing the screening, the TB symptom screening. It's just to inform the community, elder people who come to, you know, pagoda, and then saying during this date, you know, there will be a team coming and they will do. Uh, TB screening, college sputum, and so on, just to notify, you know, those uh, group. Uh, regarding your question on, on chair x-ray, actually the similar, uh, the health, actually the activity involved the health center staff. So the one, when, when the result from, of expert is coming, you know, to a health center, and they're still saying that this person need to refer further to refer hospital normally at Far, farther away, uh, then they will notify, they will inform the village health support group in the community, try to identify those people and then refer them. Normally they refer in the group, not, not individual, because it's, you know, the transportation is very costly. Thank you, Michelle. Um, thanks for the question, Rachel. Um, on reflection, I think I've probably used the term we in our presentation in a way that might have been um, a little confusing. Um, I was often referring to we as results because we are the ones within the TB Forum who hold a lot of the political relationships. Um, so I often go to a lot of these meetings with whoever else it is from the Forum that we draw in as appropriate. Um, but part of doing that is to help other people begin to cultivate their own relationships. And who we take into those meetings, as I said, depends on the issue. And the issues on which we meet politicians will often vary depending on context. So for us, a lot of the time, it's about Papua New Guinea. Um, just last month, we, as results, found out that the PDPs were coming to Canberra and we jumped on that immediately and were able to get the co-chairs uh, the, the co of the caucus to meet with the PDPs as well as have uh, the chair of the forum meet with the PDPs as well. So that came through us because we hold the relationships, but in a lot of cases it's just seeing who we can draw in. It's not about me going, I'm going to meet with these people because they're already my friends or we'll have a cosy little time together. I'm always thinking, well, I will go and meet with them because I know them. Who else am I going to take with me? And it's all about enabling them to then begin building their own relationships, which we can then help them as the people who talk with politicians all the time to, if they want to have a future meeting, well, oh, how do I do that? Um, what, what, should, what should I say to this guy? Um, what's he interested in? We can help them with that sort of advice. And often they then go on to form their own relationships and that's what the enabling of the forum and the advocacy knowledge that results has is about together. Thank you so much. Batmag. Hi, thank you for your question. Um, as a criteria, there isn't any specific Yasi that we took into consideration. For Amitabh Bachchan, he himself came forward as a cured TB survivor. So that was a big piece to us for us to attach. For the member of parliaments, we had sensitized about a group of 20 parliaments together, out of which about five came forward with specific support and efforts that they could probably get into their constituencies. Uh, for corporates, 
and the leading uh, corporate heads, I think we met with the ones who were working in the area of TB. Um, so they all are working at some levels. But the idea was to get their heads and their corporate leaders talk about it more. Uh, so Ratan Tata, who's our ch TB champion, his, uh, his, his, his company, Tata Trust, it works into, into, uh, it's into the India Health Fund, and they're investing quite a lot with USAID into tuberculosis. So there was a natural connect there with him. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, I'm gonna ask a question myself. Um, <laughs> yes, sorry. Okay, uh, my name is Mango Otto. I'm the TB uh, rep for Nice Guidelines. Now, uh, in the UK, this is where I work. Now, I've got one question to Cambodia. Where is it? See you. That question relates to the question from Nigerian my, uh, colleague. My question to you is this. Your pastors, uh, imams, you call them the leader, the church leaders, do you pay them? No, we don't pay them. So how do you, how, how do you think, why they have to get involved free of charge? <laughs> so I, I think probably in different contexts in, in, uh, in Cambodia, the religious leader, uh, uh, normally I think in, in Muslim as well, we don't, I think they don't pay because the con normally there is a contribution from community offering to a religious leader for living. So actually a religious leader, as we call a monk, so a monk is not, you know, they, their role is just to, to learn about religious doctrine, one, and then they have some kind of uh, a blessing because we believe in next life. So whatever people are coming to, to pray and offering food, it's offering free of charge to, to those religious leaders. So what th th their living is depends so much on the community. So this is the way that one of their role is to, you know, help and support those community as well as a payback. And then in, in, in some extent, if they have a lot of contribution, then they will go into to build, you know, road, construction road, and some, you know, some school for, for children as well, especially. Uh, so that. Sorry, I've got the next question. The next question. Hello? Okay, the next question is to Emily. Michelle. Michelle. Um, again, the question to Michelle is this. I'm from Congo myself, although I work in the UK, uh, on TV and everything. My question is, in the UK it's very easy you call up your MEP and you go and see him. Easy. Mm -hmm. Now, for our colleague from Nigeria, from South Africa, from every country, including from India, what, what kind of message or advice and how do you think they should approach their MEP? Because you must be brothers, sister, or auntie to see your MEP. Mm -hmm. They've got bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks. I think. Um, look, it's been said that all politics is local. Um, it would be foolish of me coming from an Australian context to tell someone from Nigeria or Congo how to interact with their politicians. I've heard what you say of politics being quite nepotistic being true. But at the end of the day, I come back and, and I face my own frustrations sometimes in dealing with politicians. But at the end of the day, I come back to my point that they are all human beings. Mm. Um, and we know that TB doesn't discriminate. So it's entirely possible that your very wealthy, well-connected politician will contract TB or knows someone in their family who has. And that personal interest and that personal connection is always a great way in. Uh, within your political system, I can't comment on what the best way is to interact with someone, but I do know that a personal connection through something like that and through the understanding that arises because of that is always an excellent start. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I think just to add on to what uh, Michelle presented, we, we also have a model similar to what Michelle and others have in Australia, in Zambia. Uh, this is where we, we engage the MPs. For us, what we do again is we use the affected communities themselves but believe it or not, in as much as we always think 
most of us in Africa keep our MPs on a pedestal, like we cannot reach them. And it's more like they save us. I mean, we, we save them or the other way around. But then what I notice is that in many cases, they actually appreciate when the people in their constituencies go to them with issues. So what we do is that we've engaged, uh, we, we've trained the indigenous grassroots, the people in the community themselves who know their MPs, on how to go out into the community to find out what the issues are and they write letters to their MPs. So you can imagine if we have something like 20 constituencies all talking about the same issue in parliament. It's very easy for that case to go. I know we always find it difficult to get our MPs, but believe it or not, just now when we get time to get money for the Global Fund for the Replenishment in Zambia, we sent more than 200 letters to our Minister of Health. Believe it or not, whether it doesn't want notice or not, notice you or not, 200 letters is a lot for them to notice and find out who you are. So it's really writing the letters and getting them to the right people. They will definitely, definitely respond to you. Thank you so much. I think we are now, we've now reached the end of our session. First of all, a big hand to all our presenters. And my co-chair here, Carol, you've been very uh, nice and wonderful. And our volunteer up there from Congo for asking the question. It was really enlightening. And everyone, everyone for coming here. It was really nice to uh, have you here. Thank you and all the best. Enjoy the rest of the conference.